This is Space Time, Series 21, Episode 14. Coming up on Space Time, supermassive black holes outgrowing their galaxies. The hypothetical axion now looking less likely as a dark matter candidate. And dark storms on the planet Neptune. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. Two new studies have discovered that the biggest black holes in the universe appear to be growing faster than the rate of stars being formed in their galaxies. Over many years, astronomers have gathered data on the formation of stars in galaxies and in the growth of supermassive black holes at the centres of those galaxies. And these data have always suggested that the black holes and the stars in their host galaxies grow in tandem with each other. But now findings from two independent groups of researchers indicate that the black holes at the centres of the most massive galaxies are growing much faster than those at the centres of less massive ones. The lead author of one of the studies, Guang Yang from Penn State University, says the findings were contained in extraordinary data taken from a range of different telescopes, including NASA's Hubble and Chandra Space Telescopes, as well as ground-based observatories. Yang and colleagues studied the growth rate of black holes in galaxies at distances of 4.3 to 12.2 billion light-years from Earth. The X-ray data included the Chandra Deep Field South and Deep Field North, as well as the Cosmos Legacy Surveys. The authors calculated the ratio between a supermassive black hole's growth rate and the growth rate of stars in its host galaxy. It was thought that this ratio would be roughly consistent for all galaxies. But instead, the authors found that this ratio appears to be much higher for more massive galaxies. For galaxies containing around 100 billion solar masses worth of stars, the ratio is about 10 times higher than what it is for galaxies containing, say, around 10 billion solar masses worth of stars. Of course, the next question is why the difference? The authors suggest that it could be the more massive galaxies are, the more effective they are at feeding cold gas into their central supermassive black holes compared to less massive galaxies. In the second study, scientists independently found evidence that the most massive black hole's growth rates has easily outstripped that of stars in their host galaxies. The Spanish Institute of Space Science's Mar Mascour and colleagues examined black holes in some of the brightest and most massive galaxies in the universe. They studied 72 galaxies located at the centres of galaxy clusters at distances ranging up to 3.5 billion light-years from Earth. The study used X-ray data from Chandra, as well as radio telescope data from the CSIRO's Australia Telescope Compact Array, the Very Large Array in New Mexico, and the Very Long Baseline Array. Mascour and colleagues estimated the masses of black holes in these galaxy clusters by using a relationship linking the mass of a black hole to the X-ray and radio emissions associated with that black hole. The black hole masses were found to be about 10 times larger than masses estimated by other methods using the assumption that the black holes and galaxies grew in tandem. Mascour found the black holes are far bigger than expected. The authors speculate that maybe these black holes in the really big galaxies got a head start, or maybe they've just had a bit of an edge in the speed of growth that's lasted for billions of years. The researchers found that almost half of the black holes in their sample had masses estimated to be at least 10 billion times the mass of the Sun. They say this places them in a category which some astronomers are now calling ultra-massive black holes. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Researchers say one of the prime candidates for dark matter, the as-yet-still-hypothetical axion, is now looking less likely, after new experiments showed that, if it exists, it would have to be far weaker and lighter than previously thought. Even though dark matter is invisible, scientists know it exists and has mass because they can see its gravitational influence on stars and galaxies across the universe. These observations have allowed astronomers to determine that dark matter makes up about four-fifths of all the matter in the universe. The remaining one-fifth is composed of what we call baryonic matter. That's the stuff that stars, planets, clouds of gas, houses, people, cars, dogs and cats are made out of. However, scientists still don't know exactly what dark matter is. Their best candidates were wimps and machos. 
Machos, or massive compact halo objects, include stuff made out of normal matter, such as black holes, brown dwarfs, orphan planets and other stuff which could hide unnoticed in the dark outer halos of galaxies. WIMPs, on the other hand, are weakly interactive massive particles, tiny but very heavy slow-moving subatomic particles which aren't part of baryonic matter and don't interact with photons or electromagnetism. And right now, most of the smart money's on WIMPs. WIMPs would include a range of hypothetical supersymmetrical particles such as axions and neutralinos. The front runner was the axion, a hypothetical elementary particle initially invented back in 1977 to overcome the strong charge parity problem in quantum chromodynamics. Although several reported detections of axions have now been published, none have been conclusive. Scientists are now working on new axion detection methods using extremely powerful magnetic fields designed to convert axions into photons. Current models predict that in certain situations a photon could change into an axion and after some time it could transform back into a photon. The new, more rigorous constraints on the likely properties of axions are based on measurements of the electrical properties of ultra-cold neutrons carried out by physicists with the electric dipole movement of neutrons experiment. The neutron findings, which were reported in the journal Physical Review X, have led to some surprising conclusions. The data still implies that axions, if they exist, could well be the particle that makes up cold dark matter. The problem is they have to have a very specific mass, and they have to interact with normal matter in a very specific way. The findings represent the first laboratory data imposing real limits on the potential interactions of axions with nucleons. Nucleons are simply protons or neutrons found in the nucleus of an atom. All protons and neutrons are made up of three elemental particles called quarks, held together by force particles called gluons, which mediate the strong nuclear force. If they exist, axions would be extremely light particles, interacting with ordinary matter almost exclusively through gravity. Experiments related to measuring the electric dipole movement of neutrons measured changes in the frequency of nuclear magnetic resonance of neutrons and mercury atoms trapped in a vacuum chamber in the presence of electric, magnetic and gravitational fields. Although neutrons have no overall charge, that's why they're called neutrons, they are composed of quarks, each of which does have a positive or negative charge, giving the neutron a magnetic moment. In the presence of an external magnetic field, the neutron precesses at a rate called its Lamour frequency. And by altering the direction of the magnetic field, the authors were able to measure the change in the neutron's Lamour frequency, allowing them to work out its electric dipole moment, a measure of the distribution of positive and negative charge inside the neutron. Now, recent theoretical papers have postulated over the possibility of axions interacting with gluons and nucleons. And so if axions are in fact dark matter, and we know dark matter's everywhere, then their presence would have distorted the readings. And depending on the mass of the axion, these interactions would have caused either a smaller or larger effect on the oscillations of the nucleon's dipole electric moment. So, what does all this mean? Well, it means that the electric dipole moment of the neutron experiment could contain clues about the existence and properties of axions, and consequently of dark matter. Scientists look for frequency changes with periods in the orders of minutes or days, depending on the individual experiment. The latter would appear if there was an axion wind, that is, if the axions in near-Earth space were moving in a specific direction. At different times of the day, the measuring equipment would change its orientation relative to any axion wind. And so this would result in a cyclic daily cycle of changes in the oscillations recorded. However, nothing unusual was detected in the 10 to the minus 24 to 10 to the minus 17 electron volt mass ranges of the experiment. These were also the predicted mass ranges of the axion particle. However, what this research has done is tighten the likely constraints imposed by theory on the likely interaction of axions with nucleons by about 40 times. And in the case of potential interactions with gluons, the restrictions have increased even further, to over a thousandfold. And what all that means is that if axions do exist, and that's still a big if, they now have far fewer places to hide. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. New images of a giant dark storm cell on the distant world of Neptune show that the massive tempest is now starting to disappear. The images from NASA's Hubble Space Telescope show that the storm, once as wide as the Atlantic Ocean, is now shrinking out of existence. 
The blue ice giant Neptune is the most distant known planet in the solar system. Immense dark storms were first detected on Neptune in the late 1980s by NASA's Voyager 2 spacecraft. Since then, only Hubble has had the sharpness in blue light to track these elusive features that have played a game of hide-and-seek with astronomers over the years. In fact, Hubble found two dark storms that appeared in the mid-1990s and then later vanished. This latest storm was first seen in 2015, but it's now shrinking. Like Jupiter's great red spot, Neptune's great dark spot storm swirls in an anticyclonic direction and is dredging up material from deep inside the ice giant's atmosphere. The elusive feature gives astronomers a unique opportunity to study Neptune's deep winds, which can't be directly measured. Joshua Tollefson from the University of California, Berkeley, says the dark spot material may be hydrogen sulfide, which would mean Neptune has the pungent smell of rotten eggs. Unlike Jupiter's great red spot, which has been visible for well over 200 years, Neptune's dark vortices usually only last a couple of years, and this is the first one actually imaged as it's dying. Being so far from the Sun, scientists really have no idea how these vortices form or how fast they rotate. It's possible that created through an instability in the shared eastward and westward winds. But this dark vortex is behaving very differently from what Planet Watch has predicted. You see, dynamical computer simulations suggested that anticyclones under Neptune's wind shear would probably drift towards the equator, where they'd break up, possibly generating spectacular outbursts of cloud activity. But this dark spot, which was first seen in mid-southern latitudes, has apparently faded away rather than going out with a bang. That may be related to the surprising direction of its measured drift towards the South Pole instead of northwards towards the equator. Unlike Jupiter's great red spot, the Neptune spot isn't tightly constrained by those numerous alternating wind jets which are seen as bands in Jupiter's atmosphere. Neptune seems to only have three broad jet streams. There's a westward one at the equator and eastward ones around the north and south poles. These weather patterns are driven by the strongest sustained winds of any planet in the solar system, with recorded wind speeds of over 2,100 kilometres per hour. No instruments other than Hubble and Voyager have observed these vortices. And for now, only Hubble can provide the data needed to understand just how common or rare these Neptunian weather systems really are. The first images of the dark vortex came from OPAL, the Outer Planet Atmosphere's legacy program, a long-term Hubble project that annually captures global maps of our outer solar system's four giant planets. Only Hubble has the unique capability of probing these worlds in ultraviolet light, which yields important information not available to other telescopes. Neptune has some 17 times the mass of Earth and orbits the Sun at an average distance of 4.5 billion kilometres taking almost 165 Earth years to complete one Neptunian year. Because of its great distance from the Sun, Neptune's outer atmosphere is one of the coldest places in the solar system, with temperatures at its cloud tops approaching minus 218 degrees Celsius. Neptune has at least 13 moons, the largest of which is Triton, and it has a faint fragmented ring system comprising a series of arcs. Like Jupiter and Saturn, Neptune's atmosphere is composed primarily of hydrogen and helium, along with trace amounts of hydrocarbons and possibly nitrogen. But Neptune contains a high proportion of ices such as water, ammonia and methane. In fact, it's the traces of methane in the outermost regions of Neptune's atmosphere, which at least in part account for the planet's brilliant blue appearance. Like its sister planet Uranus, Neptune's interior is primarily composed of ices and rock, which is why the pair are classified as ice giants rather than gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. You're listening to Space Time... I'm Stuart Gary. SpaceX is continuing to bask in the glory of its successful Falcon Heavy test flight. The flight from the Kennedy Space Center's Pad 39A at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida was designed to test the new launch system by placing a dummy payload into a heliocentric trans-Mars injection orbit, circling the Sun between the orbits of Earth and Mars. And not wanting to miss a good publicity opportunity, the mission payload was SpaceX boss Elon Musk's own Tesla Roadster. As well as owning SpaceX, Musk also owns Tesla. Musk originally wanted to land the car on the surface of Mars, but international planetary protection rules prevented this due to the potential contamination risk posed. 
Strapped inside the midnight cherry red coloured sports car was a test dummy, nicknamed Starman, wearing one of SpaceX's new generation astronaut spacesuits. The new Falcon Heavy launch vehicle comprises three Falcon 9 core stages mounted side by side. The combined power of the 27 Merlin engines allows it to lift payloads of up to 64 tonnes into low Earth orbit and 17 tonnes on missions to Mars. This makes the Falcon Heavy the most powerful launch system currently available. After finishing their job and being jettisoned, the three Falcon 9 core stages were programmed to return to Earth. The two side booster cores each touching down on a landing pad at Cape Canaveral, while the centre core was to undertake a seaborne landing on the autonomous drone ship, of course I still love you, positioned downrange in the North Atlantic Ocean. The landings at the Cape went spectacularly well, with both core stages landing in unison side by side, like some scene out of a sci-fi movie. However, the seaborne landing didn't go so well, instead crashing and burning. The core missed the landing barge by about 100 metres, hitting the water at 484 kilometres per hour, in the process damaging two of the drone ship's thrusters. Musk says the centre core booster only ignited one of the three Merlin engines that were supposed to light up during the landing burn. He says the two engines didn't fire because the central core simply ran out of ignition fluid. The SpaceX CEO has also confirmed that a third drone ship is now being built for landing core stages. The company currently has two drone ships, Of Course I Still Love You, which is stationed in the Atlantic Ocean for launches from Cape Canaveral, and Just Read the Instructions, which is stationed in the Pacific for launches from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. The new drone ship, to be named the Shortfall of Gravitas, will also be stationed at Cape Canaveral. The weird names of these drone ships follows Musk's tradition of naming the ships after spaceships from Ian e. M. Banks' science fiction novels. SpaceX also recently commissioned another ship named Mr. Stephen, a specialist payload fairing recovery vessel. The boat's equipped with four giant arms designed to collect the protective payload fairings once they're jettisoned during a launch. The fairings form the two halves of the nose cone and are designed to protect the satellite payload from aerodynamic pressures during the launch phase of the mission. They're jettisoned once the launch vehicles left Earth's atmosphere. Usually they simply fall back down to Earth, either burning up and disintegrating during the fall or crashing down and sinking in the ocean. SpaceX thinks it'll save about $5 million, that's close to 10% of launch costs, by reusing the fairings. As well as a full manifest of Falcon 9 launches this year, at least two more Falcon Heavy flights are slated for 2018. A certification flight will launch in June for the US Air Force. They will also include numerous secondary payloads, including the Planetary Society's Light Cell CubeSat, which will test the new solar cell design, the Prox-1 NanoSat, NASA's Green Propellant Infusion Mission Technology Demonstrator, the Deep Space Atomic Clock Satellite, which will test the new miniaturized Mercury Ion Atomic Clock for navigation, six Cosmic-2 Meteorology and Space Weather satellites, and the US Air Force's ISAT Electronic Scanning Antenna Spacecraft. A third SpaceX Falcon Heavy launch later this year will carry a Saudi telecommunications satellite into orbit. Jonathan Nally from Australian Sky and Telescope magazine says the Falcon Heavy test flight has exceeded all expectations. I was a real cynic, Stuart, prior to the launch when we were all told that uh, he put one of his cars, or his personal car, on top of this thing and was going to launch it out into space. I thought, what a silly stunt, you know, what a crazy thing to do. Why not put something... You know, a science payload. Board. Yeah, science payload or something. But as soon as I saw those first pictures and I saw this mannequin driving off into space... It I looked like the Stig. The, it looked like the Stig. It was just one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, particularly that picture looking back at the Earth. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it's just absolutely staggering. So good on them. Well done. And, and of course, a lot of, lot of misreporting. You've probably mentioned this on your show already, but a lot of misreporting about it. Oh, it's gone beyond Mars, so they've missed their target and it's going to get destroyed in the asteroid. Yeah, I was actually asked that on air. And I was, at the time, the way it was phrased was, this thing's missed Mars, it's going to be hit by an asteroid, it's in the asteroid belt. And I'm thinking, well, it takes six months to get to Mars, and yeah. how could it have missed Mars yet? It was only when I, I actually did the calculations myself that I realised what's happened simply is that it's overshot the Mars target, and it's now going to be going a big long loop around the asteroid belt, and then back just inside of Earth's orbit around the Sun. That's right, it's in a solar orbit, an orbit around the Sun, that the closest point is near Earth's orbital distance, and the original the original idea was that the furthest point in its orbit would be around the Mars orbital distance, but it's going further than that. And people are saying, oh, well, that, that's, you know, it's a, it's a failure because it's not going to go near Mars. That, that was not the intention. And in fact, it's not a failure. It's fantastic. It's a success. It, that means yeah. these rockets more powerful than, than anyone thought. 
and, and that means that you can either send a payload further than you, than, than you thought you can, so it's more capable that way, or you could send a payload to the same distance, but you could send a heavier payload, which is great because it's, it's always a trade-off when you send spacecraft out about how much you can put on board. So the other thing I wanted to mention about the Falcon Heavy, of course, everyone's making a big deal about the um, fact that the booster rockets came back and landed, which was... Crazy. Oh, what a spectacular sight that was, the two booster rockets landing side by side. The reason that Elon Musk and his team can do this is that their booster rockets, or all of their rockets, are liquid-fueled rockets. That means that inside the big tube of the rocket, you've got a fuel tank and you've got a tank of oxygen. And those are the two things that you, that you can combust in the engine at the bottom and the thrust comes out the bottom. The wonderful thing about a uh, liquid-fueled rocket like that is it's just like your car. You can switch it off. And if you've got any fuel left, you can switch it back on again, which is what they do. So the booster rocket took off, did its job, well, both of them did, switched off the engine, came back down, and then they turned the engines on again as just as it was coming down to land, and that's what gave it the thrust to land nice and slowly. So you can do that with a liquid fuel rocket. Now, take your mind back to the space shuttle. The space shuttle had two big booster rockets on the side, okay? Enormous, enormous powerful rockets, but they weren't liquid fuel. They were solid fueled rockets. And what that means is that instead of having a fuel tank on board and an oxygen tank on board, these big tubes are just filled with this rubbery sort of substance, a bit like the consistency of one of those pencil erase and people still use them. So this whole tube was filled with that except for a big hole that went right down through the middle. And what happened is right up the top of the rocket pointing downwards was a big flamethrower. And at the instant of the ignition, the flamethrower would burst this huge tongue of flame down through this special hole through the middle of the rocket. And then the fuel, this sort of solidish rubbery fuel, would start burning from the inside out. And the thrust only had one way to go, which was out the bottom. And there you've got yourself a rocket. But the difference is that you cannot switch those rockets off. They're like a sky rocket or a firework. Once you get it started, you can't stop them. You've got to wait till they burn out. And this was always the sort of peril that the space shuttle was in, that once you started it, uh, you, you couldn't stop them, and you had about 2 minutes and 12 seconds until they burned out during ascent, and then they broke away and came back down. They actually splashed into the water, and NASA would send out boats to bring them back. So just like Elon Musk's Falcon 9 rockets, which are going to be reused, NASA reused the solid rocket boosters from the space shuttle. But here's the thing. Going way, way back to the beginning of the 1970s, NASA didn't want to use a solid rocket booster for its space shuttle. It wanted to use liquid fuel boosters, right, like Elon Musk. There were ideas for having what they call flyback boosters to somehow try and get them to come back and land on the ground again, either vertically or put some deployable wings on them so they could glide back down and land on a runway. But the American government said to NASA, no, they're too expensive, we can't give you the money. And while everyone thought the first moon landing, Apollo 11, was just the best thing they'd ever seen in their whole life, public lost interest immediately afterwards, basically. And everyone lost interest. The government lost interest. The last Apollo flights, they weren't even being covered by the TV network. And in fact, there were supposed to be three more Apollo flights. Yeah, that's why we've got those lovely big rockets sitting there at Kennedy and uh, at Houston. And I think there's another one somewhere else too, isn't it? Yeah, yeah they've got three three rockets that would have gone to the moon. Um, so Apollo's 18, 19 and 20. That's it. Things were tough back in the early 70s and NASA was trying to get its space shuttle program approved so they were told no these liquid fueled rockets you want to use are too expensive come up with something else and the only other thing else they could come up with were solid rocket boosters right the solid fuel well they were developing that technology anyway for use on ICBMs as a replacement for liquid fueled missiles that's right intercontinental ballistic missiles which are great because they don't have people on the top of them and they can store for a long time that was the other advantage of them for a missile use you didn't have that lag time of filling them up with cryogenic fuel and liquid oxygen before you could launch. That's right, they were ready to go. But the, the, the peril remained that if you were going to use them for people, then uh, once you turned them on, you couldn't turn them off. So that leads me to the Space Shuttle Challenger in 1986. NASA was forced to compromise and go with solid rocket boosters for its space shuttle because the government said, no, the liquid fuel ones are too expensive. Now, the problem with making a solid rocket booster of the size that was needed for the space shuttle was that you couldn't make it all in one big tube. You had to make segmented tubes, smaller tubes, stack them on top of each other, bolt them together, and put a special seal where they're bolted together. And that's what they did, and they flew, you know, 120-something missions, didn't they, with the space shuttle? 135, yeah. But the problem was that the weak spot was always this join between the segments of the boosters. Yeah. Now, NASA thought they'd designed it properly and that it was all safe because that, where that weak spot is, if any of the hot flame and gases from inside the rocket when it's firing got out through that tube, it would be catastrophe. It would be like well, a blowtorch on the liquid fuel tanks, wouldn't it? That's what happened. 1986, Challenger, seven people died, set the space shuttle program back years. 
They had to build a whole new replacement space shuttle, billions of dollars. And what happened was the investigation showed that NASA knew this was a problem. But it all stemmed from budgetary problems in the beginning of the 1970s. If NASA had been allowed to go ahead and use a liquid-fueled rocket rather than this segmented solid-fueled booster system, then that would never have happened. And the original promise of the space shuttle was that it was going to be a, a regular... Yeah, every two weeks. Space. And uh, it, would, it would take military payloads, commercial payloads, as well as people. The whole idea was you'd build the space shuttles then you wouldn't need any other rocket systems. But that's not what happened. They put all their eggs into the one basket, and people seem to forget that in those early years of the space shuttle, they were launching commercial satellite payloads. And in fact, this Challenger flight that blew up, that had commercial payloads on board, and there was pressure to get this flight off the ground on that particular day when it should not have flown. After the Challenger explosion, they said, right, oh, no more commercial payloads. We'll just go back to launching government scientific satellites and some military stuff. But they had canned most of their other rockets. Yeah. So that left everyone in a real cleft stick when Challenger blew up because they only had one or two other kinds of rockets left because the shuttle was going to do everything. Its promise was every couple of weeks it was going to launch and it was going to be so much cheaper than standard rockets because you're going to reuse the shuttle and everything. It comes back down to the ground. It didn't live up to its promise for all sorts of reasons and that's a shame. That said, it was still a fantastic, amazing machine and a fantastic program but as I said, that one decision way back in the early 70s to use one kind of rocket instead of the other meant they couldn't switch those rockets off if there was a problem and that doomed seven people. That's Jonathan Nelly from Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Beijing has launched another pair of Beidou navigation satellites as part of its ongoing bid to develop its own independent satellite navigation system. The Beidou 3, Mio 3 and Mio 4 spacecraft were launched aboard a Long March 3B rocket from the Jiaquang Satellite Launch Centre in Sichuan Province. The new additions join four other Beidou 3 satellites, making up the third phase of Beijing's growing satellite navigation constellation. The Beidou, or Compass Navigation System, is expected to be complete in 2020. The new system replaces the original experimental Badu-1 system of four satellites in geostationary orbit. When completed, it will consist of a constellation of 35 Badu-2 and new generation Badu-3 satellites. These will include five in geostationary orbit for backwards compatibility with Badu-1, 27 in medium Earth orbit, and three in inclined geosynchronous orbits. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. A new study warns that the rate of sea level rise is accelerating. The findings, reported in the journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, are based on over a quarter of a century's worth of sea level measurements by both NASA and European satellites. They show that the rate of global sea level rise has been accelerating over recent decades rather than increasing steadily. This acceleration, driven mainly by increased melting in Greenland and Antarctica, has the potential to double the total sea level rise projected by 2100 when compared to earlier projections assuming a constant rate of sea level rise. If the rate of sea level rise continues to change at this pace, average global sea levels will rise by 65 centimetres by 2100, and that's enough to cause significant problems for all coastal populations. And scientists warn that given the large changes being caused in the ice sheets today by global warming, this is almost certainly a conservative estimate. The rate of sea level rise in the satellite era has risen from about 2.5 millimetres per year in the 1990s to around 3.4 millimetres per year today. Rising concentrations of greenhouse gases in Earth's atmosphere increase the temperature of air and water, which causes sea levels to rise in two ways. Firstly, warmer water expands, and this thermal expansion of the ocean has contributed to about half of the 7 centimetres of global average sea level rise we've seen over the past 25 years. Secondly, melting land ice flows into the ocean, also increasing sea level across the globe. New research is showing that the already highly endangered Tasmanian devil population is continuing to decline rapidly due to facial tumour disease. A new study warns that the problems now so severe, Tasmanian devils face extinction in the wild. 
Facial tumour disease is a contagious cancer found only in Tasmanian devils. It's transmitted from one animal to another through biting, a common behaviour among devils when mating and feeding. The disease kills all infected devils within 6 to 12 months and there's no known cure or vaccine. The new study shows that populations have decreased by about 80% and those that are left are in very small isolated groups. Researchers also have found that the remaining wild populations are starting to show reproductive changes, possibly in response to the challenges posed by the disease. Devils in diseased areas are now breeding younger and having more pouch young, which has allowed them to persist at low levels in the wild. And the structure of the wild devil population has also shifted dramatically, with devils over the age of two now being very rare. Earlier breeding in young devils also means they're now contracting the disease earlier, often as one-year-olds. A new study claims people who are bullied by siblings during childhood are up to three times more likely to develop psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia in early adulthood. The findings, reported in the journal Psychological Medicine, also show that the more often children are involved in sibling bullying as victims or perpetrators, the more likely they are to develop a psychotic disorder. Researchers also found that children bullied both by siblings and at school are up to four times more likely to develop psychotic disorders. The findings are based on a study of almost 3,600 kids from the age of 12 until they were 18. Psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia and bipolar disorder cause abnormal thoughts and perceptions and often involve hallucinations or delusions. Sufferers often experience severe distress and changes in behaviour and mood and have an increased risk of suicide and health problems. Scientists have discovered a molecular switch in the brain which regulates fat burning and could provide a way to control weight gain following dieting. Researchers at Melbourne's Monash University identified a protein called carnitine acetyltransferase, or CRAT. It was discovered in hunger processing cells in the brain which potentially controls the human body's capacity to store fat, especially after long periods of famine or weight loss, a process that underlies yo-yo dieting, where people rapidly regain the weight they lost by dieting. The findings, published in the journal Cell Reports, could provide an opportunity of manipulating the protein and trick the brain into not replacing the lost weight through increased appetite or fat storage. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audioboom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favourite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., around the world on TuneIn Radio, and as part of Virgin Australia's in-flight entertainment. If you want more space time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Space Time with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash spacetimewithstuartgary. Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 